Hey everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, good evening, and thanks for watching live or coming back to uh, to watch it. We're thrilled um, to have some special guests on the call and to really dig deep into video games, the past, present, and future, and what's happening. So with that, I want to do a, a quick general intro and frame out the conversation of uh, what I'll be talking to, uh, talking through and talking about with our guests. Um, and um, we'd like to kick things off with just uh, where are you calling in from and what industries are you from? So inside the chat, just love to hear, add your name if you want, but the industries, so medical, technology, publishing, games, uh, just love to see some of these things pop up and uh, and read them as they come. So um, Stephanie, do you want to just do any, any shout outs of the industries that are popping up? Yeah, so we've got educational games, an arcade game company, media and broadcast, uh, AV home automation, video editing, higher education, business education, instructional design, nuclear training. Wow, we are all over the place here utilities, more ed tech games, government, public safety, Department of Physics and Astronomy in Quebec. Awesome. We have people that's from awesome. all over today. Yeah, that's great. That's proof that uh, so many industries use games for learning. So um, great roll call. We'd like to uh, keep those coming. And don't forget, if you've got a good question, drop it into the chat. Stephanie will set it up for preview for the end of the call. So let's jump back in time and do past first. So Nolan started a and back in the 1969, 1971, um, a company that started off with computer space and then went into Pong, then went into the launch of Atari, then hired Steve Jobs. He was one of Steve Jobs' first boss. So I'm sure a lot of these things are, are going to going to be talked about. In 1976, stole Atari to Warner Communications then started Chuck E. Cheese Pizza, then started a catalyst incubator company with all sorts of great games, educational camps for kids, multiple different companies, uh, was really there at the launch of, of GPS that you you know use your phone to get to work today or go to a meeting. Some of that technology came from, a, from a, the birth of a company called uh, ETAC GPS. And the 80s and 90s continued that. It started with this company called Androbot and 20 plus different ed tech startup companies. Uh, I love this story, the the U Wink technology and games, and uh, and I just think of this years ago, the concept of ordering your food on a, almost an iPad device in a restaurant. Um, the, Nolan did it first, uh, then started a book called uh, and published a book, Finding the Next Steve Jobs. Then connected with Dr. Leah Haynes and started the next book now, which we're going to talk about today. An amazing read. I definitely think you should should pick it up. I enjoyed it. Uh, we'll talk with Dr. Leah about Exodexa, what she's doing at 2-Bit Circus, and the impact of games on learning as well. So yeah, just a recap of, of what we'll kind of get through and then to your Q&A. So some retrospective moments in video games, why video games are still performing so strong in learning for adults, uh, what they're doing together as a team and video games and the education side of, side of things. And then also a lot of folks in L&D. Um, what you should and uh, be considering if you're thinking about putting games into your learning experience. And um, and of course, a little conversation about what's happening with the influx of AI and augmented reality in the game space. So with that, I'm going to go back to the big screen and uh, bring our guests. And we'll start off with Nolan. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And um, first and foremost, you know, do you want to talk about any of those key moments in the past at Atari or, you know, being Steve Jobs' first uh, first manager and its uh, its impact on the video game space? Well, you know, I'd like to categorize my life as a series of happy accidents. And, <laughs> that, you know, I can't say that my life trajectory has been planned in any way. It's been kind of opportunities presented, opportunities accepted, sometimes opportunities rejected. Like I I could have owned a third of Apple computer for $50,000. And uh, I said, no, that was a mistake. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, what I've found is that as long as you are willing to try to make the future happen sooner, it's almost always a good trajectory um, because 
most of the invention in the world has happened in science fiction. Um, and all you have to do is figure out what they were designing and doing in, in science fiction books and figure out what the technology, could you do it now? And, uh, and a lot of times the answer is yes. But um, that's kind of where we are. And, and video games do this thing called getting you into flow. And that's the almost the hypnotic state, which is extremely powerful for learning. And so at Exodexa, we are building games that can put a student in flow that the kids want to, to play. And when they complete the game, they've co completed the syllabus for high school. That's kind of the big overarching plan. So series of games, series of adventures, play them all and you can graduate. Um, and um, and I think that we will, the thing that is another characteristic of, of gameplay is score. Well, what if we substitute score for the SATs? And so you'll know if you get a high score, if you, if you played the game well, you'll get a high SAT. I don't know. Just, just mm -hmm. kind of rambling here. No, that's great. I think uh, there was there's a lot of recent, uh, even a movie, I think it was the uh, the Tetris movie uh, where they talked about flow and this, this uh, you know, the zone that people get in. And I look back, one of the first articles that I could find about Pong and its use in, in medical learning was like a 1971 article and you said there was a there's a hospital in St. Helena, California that was having Pong users. Um, they're using Pong to help stroke victims regain control of paralyzed muscles. So, I mean, this this had to be at a time you know you're you're bringing Pong in to help with medical or, or to to help with with a lesson or learning. But can you can you think of some of the other very initial aha moments with Pong or Atari? Um, when the lights went on, when you're like, okay, this, this is education, because there was another quote where you, I, I know you were making a point and then you said the minute you, you label something as education, um, nobody buys it. And I think you were talking about the, the purchase of video games, but you knew that people were getting educated as the undertone all along. Right. So right. I, I would love to hear your, your moments there at, um, with Pong or Atari in the early, early days. Well, we, um, when we first launched the Atari 2600, we had eight cartridges, but it might have been, been seven, because one of them was basic math that just basically threw up a bunch of math questions, and uh, it was kind of a trivia about math. It sold almost none. <laughs> and whereas whereas the other cartridges sold out almost immediately. And uh, and it was really uh, a surprising. In fact, we figured when we introduced the product, we figured that people would buy maybe two or three cartridges. Well, it turned out that, it, that we produced enough so that everybody could buy two or three cartridges. The first people who bought it bought all the cartridges except basic math. <laughs> and, and as a result, the the last half of our shipment, there was only one cartridge, the one that was shipped with the machine. So we had to really scramble to change that. So you know, who knew? Oh, you're muted, Dan. Yeah, the um, the let's talk about the the Atari Steve Jobs era and his involvement. And of course, the whole company was games. Um, what was like the the passion, the conversations that you would you know? Can you share a story that you had with Steve around game development? Um, I know there's the the urban legend of making him work at nights. Uh, uh, <laughs> because of, uh, well, Steve uh, was not an engineer. But he was a very good tech. Um, and 
my first interaction with Steve was he came in and he says, I love your company, but your your people don't know how to solder. And he had a, a circuit board and he said, there are four cold solder joints on this board alone, and that's going to cause a failure. And that's true because cold solder joints, they corrode and, and uh, it may work now, but it won't work in six months, you know, particularly in Florida where there's a lot of humidity. But and I looked at it, and he was right. And um, and I said, "Can we fix that?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "Can you can you teach everybody how to solder?" He says, "Yeah, I'll do that." And that was our first interaction. He was meticulous. Meticulous. Yeah. You you also, if you're wearing jeans or or dressing casual, can you just talk about the the Atari culture? I mean, you. And to some extent, help pioneer casual Fridays and and flex work and the things that everybody does now. I'm at a WeWork location here with ELB. Um, can you talk about, you know, what you did to, to pioneer the space? Because I, I, it sounds like you guys were all meticulous and worked smart and worked hard. Um, but but talk about that. I know you had to make changes to to get your companies where they had to go. Well, I I felt that the the best way to run a company was to focus on outcomes, not process. And in some ways, what you wear to work, when you come to work, if you go to work, is all about process. It's not about outcomes. And I felt that if you constantly focused on outcomes, that your answers would be true. Or, or effective because in most cases there are a whole bunch of different kinds of solutions to a problem and so why do they have to be my solutions can't they be your solutions because people who focus on their own solutions many times are much more effective because they bought in on it and in our planning sessions we i wouldn't let anybody bring paper because I wanted everybody to leave the planning session believing that it, that we were adopting their ideas. I wanted everybody to feel like it was their idea, you know, whatever we were going to do. Uh, and so there's kind of this, you know, hey, we're all in this together. Um, there's not a big hierarchy. Like, I tried to keep the company egalitarian like we had no executive parking spaces i always thought that was really a bad sign if if people who worked there had to work and pass all these reserved parking spots for the big wigs that are empty in the morning you know i mean you know i just felt that there were a lot of ways that you could be open and uh, we even published what everybody was making, which is kind of a no-no uh, in a lot of companies because I felt that everybody knows there's a differential. And uh, and I and you know, along with that, you know, people would know that if they were able to accomplish X, Y, and Z, that they could make that much money too. I mean, it was kind of a we were making it up as we're going along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a, a, so many of us are using, you know, the games, the, you know, taking our companies, our employees to a Dave and Buster's for an outing. Like, I, I'm wondering, what would you do inside Atari or Chuck E. Cheese? Like, how would you actually use gaming, which I, I think I know, I would assume, but would you guys do gaming sessions with your employees, you know? whether it was Monopoly or, or you know, something else. I'm wondering how you would use games internally for training at a place that is flooded with, with games everywhere. Well, we had, a, we had a game room. We kept one copy of every coin-op game that we did. Uh, we also had a foosball table in the, in the lawn in the, and a pool table in the, in the cafeteria. Uh, 
another thing that I did is I had a beer tap in my office. <laughs> and uh, at six o'clock, everybody knew that the beer tap was on. Then was anybody. A.M. A- a- or P.M.? P.M. <laughs> <laughs> And we uh, we would have a prototype of our game and a blackboard next to it, and we'd play the game and annotate comments on the blackboard. These were this was you know three months before the game actually went into the market, so it was still time to make changes. But we also played liar's dice a lot. It was, you know, a lot of money changed hands. We didn't play poker that much, but liar's dice, yeah. Interesting. And and dollar bill poker. I don't know if you've ever played that, where you uh, have a dollar bill and uh, you wager based on the serial number. That was another big ah. Yeah. There we go. I, I, there's a bunch of people that are going to play on this call now and be looking it up. That's amazing. Well, Okay, the, the idea is that, you know, a one is is an ace, two is a two, three, you know, and uh, and we ignored the letters. It was just the number on the dollar bill. And then for those of you who don't know how wires work, you go around and you bid, and what you're bidding on is the collective. So if you say... If there are four of you playing, for example, you're you're bidding what everybody has. So if I bid seven aces, that means that if we look at all the different serial numbers on the on the bills that we if we just have one bill each. And if there are seven ones in those things then I win. If I bid more, I lose and I have to pay everybody. If I win, mo- everybody has to pay me. Yeah. I don't know if uh, if, if all companies can legally uh, exchange uh, tender and gamble in the office, but uh, that sounds like a great <laughs> game. I love it. They have I, to figure out a Venmo version of it too. Um, oh, yeah. For, for the cashless society. Um, let's... You know, t- talking about games, coming back to Atari, getting a lot of great comments about the different Atari games. I'm just curious. I know people are as well. You know, if if you had to run out of your your magical workshop there with three original cartridges, who are your, you know, what are your beloved favorites? And I'm assuming Pong is in the mix. But, you know, are there one, two or three games that you are absolutely say Hall of Fame? I'd say that... Um... I had breakout was was one of my favorites because I had a lot of you know because that was one of my games pong because it was the OG. Um, I also liked a game called Tempest, which is a little it was a technological tour de force because it was a vector graphic thing. It was one of the first vector graphic monitors that we created and that was hard particularly to get color because there's no shadow mask in a vector graphic thing so you you get color by changing the acceleration voltage of the crt you know and switching acceleration voltage at high speed was really tricky and not a single Tempest machine exists today that has the original transistors because they were just too crappy. They've all been upgraded to something new and better. Well, with the uh, the, the fan commentary pitfall for the win, you've got a, a lot of agreement and uh, a lot of close seconds coming from uh, the long lifelong learners that are still using the games for different things. Sherry at Ducer, I know, is a big fan um tempest uh i agree with that as well frogger was that uh was that something that was your frogger team was was one that... of ours yeah. it, it was actually done by a company called sega and i think we licensed it for the 2600 but it was not one of mm-hmm. our designs it well bring game. us what's that good game though oh fantastic 
Space Invaders. Um, well, you know, there's a uh, there's one I play on my phone right now called Crossy Roads. I don't know if you've ever downloaded it. Same game. <laughs> nice. Not getting any uh, any uh, um, any money from that, I suppose. Centipede. There we go. Yeah. That, so centipede, bring us through. But, but you know, Centipede was the first game that was designed by a woman. Is that right? Donna Bailey. Oh, huh. that was um, so. So bring us up from the Warner acquisition and just fast track up through the the days of the educational startups, which has been some amazing. Are there a couple of favorites in there? And then which brings us up to uh, Exodexa and the in the book and the relationship with Dr. Haynes. Well, um, when I left Atari, actually, I left Atari. Sold the company in 76, and they, I had actually started Chucky in 1975. Uh, I think we were open just in the fall, about, about the same time we we, uh, we opened the first one. And Warner didn't want it. They didn't want to be in the food business, so they sold it to me, uh, all the tech and everything like that. And I was growing it part time while I was still chairman of Atari. And you know, you find out that when the company's not yours, it's not as much fun. At least I found it wasn't. And and so I went off and sort of focused on Chuck E. Cheese, and and then I got really interested in Catalyst. You know, I had all these projects inside Atari, and after I sold Atari. I noticed that Warner kind of shut most of them down, meaning that I had spent a lot of money on these projects that had no value to the to the buyer. So I felt, okay, if I'm going to be prolific with these new ideas, I should keep them separate. And so I started Cattle's Technologies to sort of pursue these weird ideas. And I raised some VC money and I put some of my own money in it. And and uh, and I got interested in, and it was sort of the creative outlet for my wandering mind. I, I tell everybody that I have five-year ADD. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's working out for you, that's for sure. Um, so anyway, well, I think... it, you know, and, and um, so to fill in the timeline, Catalyst probably gave me my first um, step into the education field when I did this thing called Camp Timber Tech, in which we taught computer skills while camping. And, uh, you know, and and so that that's kind of the first one. And then later on, I did a game, a company called Brain Rush, which developed adaptive practice technology, but the market wasn't there. Um, and then, uh, COVID came along and Lee and I were talking one night over a cocktail, I might add, as we, <laughs> as we should at, at, the, at my son's two bit circus place. And, uh, and we decided that we had a shared vision of what was happening and that there was in fact a marketplace, uh, and that we should pursue gamified education. And, and then I had written an outline for a book, you know, I, I mean, a sort of a treatment. And I said, I'd send it to her. And, and Leah said that it should be a book, not just a treatment. And so she was able to put the rigor as an academic, the book even has footnotes. You know, so <laughs> yeah. So um, that, that I love the fun. book, by the way, got the book. Uh, and I I love the grayed out version where you've identified this is where Nolan is speaking. And it, it, it almost sensed a little gamified inside the book, which I thought was amazing. Um, and I oh, think, uh, yeah, right. So with that, um, I'll introduce Dr. Haynes to talk a little bit more about the book, I think, and, and what you're doing with uh with the mission of the book with what's happening at two-bit circus foundation um but let's let's jump into that hello okay 
So Two Bit Circus Foundation is how I was introduced to to Nolan because uh, his son uh, Brent is the chairman of the nonprofit, and we work in education. So I had about ten years of uh, working in schools and uh, doing professional development, trying to get teachers to move from lecture style to learning by doing. And then the conversation that night with uh, with Nolan, what really struck me was the one uh, one of the comments about if you know he said you know there are a lot of kids who are diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Some of them probably have it, but I can tell you who doesn't have it if you give me a little bit of time with them in front of their favorite video game. If they if it's truly attention deficit disorder, they wouldn't shouldn't be able to focus on the game either. And and it fit very uh, handily with my concerns about education, that we're we're taking kids who have a plethora of uh, intense and exciting games to play and movies to watch and and things to and and we're sitting them down for eight hours a day and lecturing to them. and it just is not productive. and and when you know, I've uh, my grandson was playing uh, Roblox and explaining to me some very intricate parts of the game he was playing, and I was thinking, like, wouldn't it be wonderful if all these things that he's memorizing were actually something that would value his life and his educational experience? And then I'm late to the video game world. I was the mom telling my son, "Hey, get off your video games and do your homework." Now I wish I had told him, "Hey, look behind the scenes and see how those games are being made." Uh, which he did on his own anyway, and I don't think he ever did turn them off and do his homework. But he, uh, you know, just it, it just meeting kids where they are is our best shot at education. And, but you know, both uh, Brent and Nolan, the whole Bushnell family are just the greatest bunch to work with. So it's been uh, a real pleasure both writing the book with him and now building Exodexa. What are the what are the similar roadblocks you've noticed between education? Uh, embracing this concept, um, that the, some of the same challenges I'm, I'm sure that happened in enterprise. The is that is that for me, or do you want Leah to answer? I mean, if if I were to answer it, I would say that the failure of the school system is they are so enmeshed in process that they're almost tone deaf to outcomes, you know, and so it's a very, very conservative world. Um, the, the teachers are in many cases overwhelmed, you know, and, um, and to, and they, and I think that in some ways they feel like, Oh, one more thing. I don't need it. Um, I think that once we have really good proof of efficacy, we will have very, very good outcomes from the homeschooling market. That'll probably be the fastest to crack. The second will probably be, believe it or not, the parochial schools. Um, third will probably be the expense of private schools. And the last will be the public schools. Yeah. Except in certain cases. Uh, like we've been working with certain elements of LIA Unified, and it's not across the board. And uh, the Dallas, uh, Texas school system. And they, for some reason, they have some not some efficacy seekers there. Would you character? Would you agree with that, Leah? Yeah, I think um, a, a couple of things. Like, I think teachers, once they're exposed to this, will love it. I, the the problem for teachers is that they are, as as Nolan mentioned, like m in many ways, especially since the pandemic, overwhelmed. The pandemic sort of laid bare the issues that we have in education, and it's hard for it, for the uh, public school education system to make uh, significant changes because they're dealing with the futures of all these children and the status quo is easier to justify than um, than, than making uh, major changes. But the Dallas Fort Worth uh, school district and, and um, LA we with Dallas, we've done uh, seven or eight years now of steam carnivals that uh, they're sort of a 
sort of an exciting replacement for the science fair. The premise being that the science kids come to the science fair because they're interested in science, but none of the other kids come and a festival gets them all out. So mm. for a carnival. And and the Dallas Fort Worth School District is a very progressive school district. They are really, uh, at least there are elements there that are really uh, trying to meet kids where they are. And that's the the real premise of this. If we really want kids to become lifelong learners, then we can't punish them for the first twelve years of their education and mm-hmm. then expect them to continue being lifelong learners. And and it's not that I, I think anybody's deliberately punishing kids, but but we. We want them to be active learners, and we're asking them to sit still to become learners. So I think the uh, the game is uh, one of the challenges our, our executive producer's nephew said to him, yeah, okay, if you're going to do that, just don't tell kids it's educational or no one will play it. And so his reaction was, you know, challenge accepted. And mm. and, the, and our game is very game forward. The idea that, you know, we want kids to want to play this on the weekend. But what they're doing from one level to the next is strong educational value. It's something that they that that has meaning beyond the game. And there's an opportunity to do that in many games, but I mean ours is just very deliberate that way. And we will eventually have the K through uh, 12th grade uh, in buried into the game. And at a certain point, you'll know they're at level six. Well, they're ready for algebra or, you know, they're mm-hmm. at level five. We can introduce this because we know what they know by then. And, and there's no need uh, for any kind of humiliation in the classroom. If the kids are working through the game. They know the teacher knows and the software knows where they are. But nobody else does. And mm. you know, I, I grew up a slow learner. I stuttered when I was reading. I was nervous in front of the class. And I went back as an adult to do my graduate studies uh, and, and really just telling myself, I'm just going to grit my teeth and get through this. I want to do it. I'm, and then, you know, as an adult going back, it, it was just a so much more enjoyable experience. And there's no reason that it has to be that way. It's just that we have been doing education the same way for 100 years and We've maybe moved from rows to tables in some schools, but but we're doing the same thing. And it's, you know, it really needs a major overhaul. And we've had like the reaction from educators has been very positive. Yeah, yeah you know, and in the book, we talk about no grades and no grades. And, uh, and what that really means is age is an arbitrary thing. And, and if you mature slower, so if you're a slow maturing nine-year-old, why should that be a problem? You know, so if we, the minute you say that you're a third grader or fourth grader or fifth grader, it means that you're being batch processed, not you're being acted on as a group, not as an individual wrong no grades one of the bedrocks of our current school system is competition wrong because the fact that you may take slightly longer to learn a concept does anybody really care (laughs) you know and so why should somebody who just happens to be a little more mature or maybe a little bit more cognizant of various things get an a and you get a d you know what does that tell the you know it's maybe very good for the a student they get to pat themselves on the back and get the gold star on their forehead and what have you but what's it doing to the d student it's 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 a lifelong you know punishment for just being a little bit slower which even then, oh, he's a little slow. Is that bad? No. You know, the fact that it takes a little bit longer, maybe the one who's learning slower is seeing nuance that the fast learner isn't. Look, So that the knowledge is richer and more varied than somebody who isn't. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I I could rant on this. For a yeah, while. yeah. I mean, <laughs> I I would love your your opinion on, you know, any of us that that have kids um, or or plan to you know have families or are active in our schools. 
you know, what should somebody do besides, you know, taking this book and walking into a PTA meeting and asking, you know, the principal, if they're familiar with something, what are a couple of one or two takeaways that you would say, here's something you can do to, to have an impact on this and to, to drive change? Well, we say we're kind of upfront saying that the book is a little bit of a manifesto of change. That one of the rules that I had at Atari is you couldn't criticize something unless you had a plan. You know, of of what of how to fix something. Anybody could be a, you know, devil's advocate, no. Naysayer, no. To to find a problem. That's the that's the role of idiots. Only finding solutions, that's where magic comes. And so we tried very hard to have the book be solution oriented, where we say this is a problem that we perceive and this is how we fix it. And so as long as you take that as a process, um yeah, taking the book. You know, I, I've suggested that, um, you know, read the book, pass it on, buy a couple and give it to people that you think are important. And I think that that could help because I think that in some ways the book. And, and we ask, if you agree with it, become part of our, 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 manif our, 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 cadre mm. if you disagree that's okay tell me what you think can be better because mm. we're here to seek truth and it's not my truth it's the truth and so we're putting down in a book what i thought was which is my truth which i hope converges at some point with the truth which is a different thing maybe mm. Anyway. There's, there's also we started a founder circle, which is sort of a, our way of building a uh, a community for beta testing, basically, because we have now about 45 minutes of gameplay and we've done several play tests with kids. And my favorite was our, our CFO's son said, I hate games that have stuff you have to read. I just want to get in and play. Well, ours is educational, so we are definitely going to be put stuff there for them to read. So he didn't want to do the play test. He says, Dad, I'm not doing it. And his dad said, yeah, you're doing it. Just, you know, you're going to give 45 minutes, an hour of your time, and you're going to do this, and you're going to tell me what you think of it. And so he he did it, and he went to his dad after. He said, you have to tell me when the next level's ready, because I, I need to know what happens next. So we, I think the game is exciting enough to win over the kids mm. who are opposed to the uh educational side but once they're in the game it doesn't feel like an educational game it feels like a game with issues you have to solve and, you know challenges you have to face so um that's great um I'll, i'm going to show some of the things that we do with the training arcade at elb learning in a minute um, but i also wanted to to hear you know both of your your insights and just thoughts on the you know the impact of everything happening with ai augmented reality you got apple vision pros new headset and I mean, Nolan, this is, you know, is it the, the next chapter? Like, what does this feel like to you uh, from someone who's who's been there? I mean, uh, Nancy sent me a picture of you opening up a, you know, the 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 front end of uh, of uh, your your I was going to say duck hunt type video game, uh, right. but you literally, you know, have been working on circuit boards. Is is this faster computing? Is this, um, you know, to, what's your take on that? Well. If you look at one of the core things that a lot of video games do is they provide context. And, and uh, you know, abstraction is harder to get your brain to remember than things with context. And so what AR and VR do is they provide a richer context than 2D can do. And so I believe that I mean, I I shouldn't talk about this too much, but we're I'm working on this thing called a supercharger, an education supercharger. And if a tutoring center and an arcade had a baby, what would it be? <laughs> I, I I say it that way. 
uh, right. just for a little comic relief. But um, essentially, what I what I want to create is a area where we are curators as well as designers, and. My definition of a curator is one who finds the best of breed and presents it to others. And so, for example, there's a group that does a VR set of educational experiences that are mind-blowing. And so a lot of people don't have that. And so I want to curate that and put them in the supercharger along with the quest headset and you know mine's right over there um and uh and you know what better way to understand the circulatory system than to look at it through the eyes of a red blood cell <laughs> you know things like that mm. and and mm. we'll get some of these um a few folks are asking about some of these we'll get some of the, the public available links and share these in the follow-up email to uh, to folks. Scenario VR is one of the apps where you can uh, experience some different learning uh, environments. And um, what so what what's most exciting to you right now with between the headsets and AI and the big news as of the last three to four months? I am absolutely gobsmacked with AI, ChatGPT, Bing, what have you, and. And I find, so one of my theories about SAT prep is that the best way to do SAT prep is just have the kids take the test over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. And so I said, okay, where are we going to find all that stuff? And I went into chat GPT and I said, give me some questions that would likely be on an SAT test. Bloom. A tsunami of questions, you know. So, you know, is that cheating? Maybe, but it looked all the questions looked like they were rational, reasonable questions on all kinds of subjects, and and uh, so all of a sudden, boom, we, we're done. We we've got an SAT prep system ready to go. <laughs> you know, last year the the educators were you know, running around with their hair on fire, so worried and upset about what uh, AI was going to do to the classroom. And I think that there are so many valuable steps in terms, you know, having students, instead of uh, writing a paper and handing it in and the teacher spends the weekend grading it, have the students write the paper, hand it in, and then present to the class with a Q&A. And then we'll know whether they learned the material or not. And if they learned the material, do we care if AI wrote the paper for them? Because it levels the playing field for dyslexic kids or for you know ch children who are challenged yeah. with uh, linear issues. So there, and there are you know plenty of other examples of how to effectively use AI with students. And it's so amazing because most of us heard Chat GPT come from a student first, right? They said, "Hey, I just used this to to do an article." Uh, at, at least in a lot of my circles, that, those are the examples I hear: is that they they figured it out first. Um, and now they're working in jobs, and now they are being the brand champions for this initiative. But I think, Nolan, you were going to add to that. Well, I was going to add that, that I think AI it has a very, very important job that it's, it's your tutor. If you don't understand something, just ask it. And all of a sudden, it, it, and you, you can ask it to... You know, I didn't understand that. Can you describe it in another way, or can you break it down? And it'll do it. And uh, and I personally have not. You know, there, there's a lot of talk on the internet about occasionally AI hallucinates. You know, and comes up with with stuff that isn't real. Uh, I've never found that, but uh, I figure there's got to be some guardrails that we can do to keep it from doing that. Mm. You know, if all of a sudden it tells you a fictitious story, that might be valuable in and of itself to say, can you figure out when the AI is telling you a fictitious story? You know, like Interesting. I think. Nolan, I'd love to get your feedback and Dr. Haynes as well. I mean, these are these are two of the um, slides that we show a lot of our partners 
um, mm -hmm. ELB learning and our training arcade. We, we, we've got everything from the license rights to the, a Jeopardy game, a Wheel of Fortune to match games to jump games. I'm sure, Nolan, some of these things feel very similar. Oh, yeah to the things that you helped invent as well. And, um, and it's out there in the, uh, in the corporate world as well. And then you know, we really land on why using training games in your learning strategy from everything, uh, instant feedback. Uh, I even saw it in the comments, allowing learners to fail safely or bringing, yep. you know, employees together, which are, are there a few of these, you know, orange boxes that resonate? I mean, which of these points do you feel spot on or 100% right or, you know, we feel they all are, but I'm curious what the founder of Atari thinks. Well, I think that um, you know, it, I oscillate on this. Um, what's the most important thing? Is it drive? Is it creativity? But I think somehow the fail safely. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I feel like failure is something that happens. And when you fail at playing the game of chess, you set the pieces up and you play again. You know, and so stick to it, us, you know, grit. You know, you can't keep me down. I can get beaten up. And I stand up again. You know, there's an old rock song. You know, the, <laughs> what was, who, who did that? I get down, I get knocked down, then I get up again, and I get knocked down, then I get up again. That's the strategy that allows for success. It's when you get knocked down and you stay down that uh, the game's over. So, so I think that if we create robust, and resilient kids, they grow up to be powerful adults. And uh, and I actually, in my own family, I tried to challenge my kids a lot. Of that. And I would make up stories that were totally ridiculous. And, and then if they didn't call me on it, I'd make fun of them and say, did you believe that? I was telling you a bunch <laughs> of stories. And uh, and so we'd play games and I'd cheat. And uh, and, I'd, and then I'd rail against them for not catching me. I said, didn't you know that I was cheating? <laughs> and this is how I was cheating. Because what I wanted them to do is to know that, that there were various things that happen in life that were not always all kosher and that you have to be aware of it and and my kids are all pretty robust and resilient indeed indeed and and uh for those of you who don't know you, you briefly mentioned but many of them are in the game and learning industry and entertainment industry as well so uh if you're in la definitely check out two bit circus um or if you want to check out some some retro games that are still uh, available and, and a really cool idea called Polycade. Look that up as well. Um, on the gaming well, you know, front, and, on, and, and Wyatt, he just said that because of Chat GPT, it's writing code for him that it speeded his development by three x. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a use that, um, and he said, I'm not training yet; it's training me that that I'm so much better at querying what I need right now than I was a month ago and it's much more effective. So so there's there's another benefit. Well right speaking of people that, that that came up through you know your your impact, uh we've got two executives, maybe more at our company, who worked for Atari as well. It was in I believe the post Nolan era. But uh, both Stephen and Joe are our longtime Atari veterans, and uh, help, that knowledge helped us start this company. So, with that, um, also want to open it up to some really, really great questions that have come through. Thanks to everyone who's uh, been adding some great commentary and some ideas along the way. But let's have um, let's have Stephanie come back in and prime up a few questions that popped up. 
All right. Yeah. So this first one is a little long, so bear with me as I tee it up here. So from Daniel, most people approach incorporating games into learning by only bringing extrinsic motivation elements over. In my experiences, the best video games only reply only rely on a small bit of extrinsic motivation before hat switching players into long lasting intrinsic motivators. What are your thoughts on how education can go beyond that surface level gamification of learning and deeper into what actually makes people keep playing a game? I think that it's a lot about context. If you can provide strong context, you know, a good movie is one where you're no longer sitting in the seat, but you're sitting in in what's happening. So you transport yourself from an observer to a participant. That's a good movie. Um, a good game is the same thing. That's when you get into flow, that's how you lose yourself and you become active in that world. So you make a compelling world and the world teaches you something through example. You know, you, you if you screw up, you haven't learned it, you know. And so life is full of examples of things you need to learn, you know. If you're, if you go into the jungle to where there's a lot of wild animals, you might get killed. And you want to not do that. <laughs> you know, that's kind of stuff. And, you know, on that question part we we address this a bit in the book too because just before uh the pandemic i had been to washington dc to see the games that the department of education had funded the year before and they fit into that question like well, there they were uh preferable i'm sure to a student to a lecture but they were definitely an educational game they had to do to learn this and that is what you know having nolan as a partner in this is what makes it different for us is that our it is game forward it is a game that the kids will want to play and what they need to learn and memorize inside the game will be things that are of value to their education absolutely as someone says in the chat you need that suspension of disbelief to immerse them in there uh, let's see, we have another question. So Alicia says, I saw a great automotive training at DevLearn this past October, which led me to think of game learning mashups. What about Grand Theft Auto and learning to drive? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm one of these guys. I'm not a big fan of Grand Theft Auto. I don't believe that. I believe that you are what you eat. And uh, and Grand Theft Auto teaches you a lot of things that you shouldn't do. And I don't think you should be taught things that you shouldn't do in some ways. And I would much rather you learn to drive through Mario Kart than through Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> it's true. Okay, gotta watch out for those bananas in the road, though. <laughs> I think while Hi. Stephanie's queuing up the next one, I'll give you a second, Stephanie, just to uh, comb through and pick a good one. But uh, today's International Women's Day. I'd love to hear from Dr. Haynes and Nolan Bushnell. I mean, uh, Nolan, you can nominate Dr. Haynes, but uh, is there a, a coder or somebody that, you know, you really, you know, who stands out? Who would you like to kind of nominate or call out or inspires you? Name one or two people each. Oh, I think Leah is hands down one of the smartest educator. She's not really a coder, but but she knows games and she knows game theory. Um, Donna Bailey, who is a professor, who's currently a professor in Little Rock, you know, University of Little Rock, I think it's a little, might be the University of Arkansas, I'm not sure. But um, she, she worked at Atari and, and did a wonderful job. Um, who were some of the others? There are several women that have just been really important. You know, some of the early people at uh, at uh, Atari, Carol Cantor, and, and uh, 
you know, just, just, you know, it's one of those things I feel like on the Academy Awards, you, you don't want to start naming people because you'll, for, you'll forget, forget something like somebody out. Left out. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, fellow Atari folks that are dropping some good ideas in the list. So uh, be yes, sure to read the have, chat. We have a lot of people from the Atari family, it seems like, it, on today commenting. We do have a question uh, from Kevin. So today in today's webinar, we focused a lot on K-12 education. But do you think that these concepts and strategies can be applied to higher education as well? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and more than that, I think that if I were to voice another concern is that there are a lot of garbage degrees that kids are spending a lot of money for that will never pay back, you know, and I, I think that student loans have removed a certain level of moral hazard to the decision process. And when you can get free money, kids will spend that free money and then they're burdened with it. And that is really a problem. Right now, if you were to spend a six month course learning how to weld, you will make more money than 90% of college graduates things like that. So I think that I think that there is this idea that a college degree imparts a mystical quality when almost every barista at Starbucks has a degree in something. Who you know, oh hum, why? And so remember that long-term consequence part of your brain doesn't happen until you're 23, 24. That's why it's really good to have soldiers who are 19. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so to give kids the chance to really screw up their future at 1920, I mean, when I was growing up, you couldn't borrow money until you were 21. I'm not sure why that somehow doesn't apply anymore, but it was all about this inability to properly ascertain long-term consequences. And uh, and so I, um, I'm rambling on the, <laughs> this. No, it's a great point. But I just, I just feel like higher ed is broken in many cases and that there has to be, one of the things that I want to teach kids is to forward think a little bit and gameplay of what do they really want to do? Do they want to have a trash degree and spend a lot of money for it so they can be a barista at Starbucks? And my, there's a lot of against bar, start baristas. <laughs> I, I I just want to see the system a little uh, a little fairer than it is. I think I want everyone to have the opportunity to go if they want to go but to, for it to be less of a burden financially for students on the other end. And there are other countries that have figured that out. I think we should be uh, a little better about it. Yeah, yeah. affordable, flexible, relevant, you know, Free. practical Free. work is big right now. Yeah. I mean, in Germany, Scandinavia, college is free. You have to qualify. <laughs> I mean, you just can't, you know, you've got to be, able to do the work but yeah there's a lot of companies that are committing to to short-term degrees or uh, accreditation to to help you learn a skill that's applied learning uh tesla appears to have recently you know committed to that elon musk saying mm -hmm. i want people who know what they're doing a degree is important but not absolutely critical um there's an ai uh, degree that was just uh, announced uh in the los angeles area uh, where they're saying we need we need experts in this space right now, and our company alone is doing a lot of AI specific training and boot camps for companies who need to help their employees, you know, just achieve baseline. We call it AI IQ uh, with a program that helps come in and just make sure, you know, let's let's just you know dust off the uh, the doubt here and make sure everyone understands that uh, this is the this is something that can help propel them and their business. So. 
Yeah. Stephanie, what else we got? Any any other key one we wanted to? Well, we are at time, and are, I know yes. that we are. Uh, Nolan and Leah are both very busy, and I'm sure our attendees are as well. But I did want to share one comment that I thought was funny from Alicia that uh, looking at what kids like and combining it with learning is like hiding vegetables in your kids' food. So right. sometimes you can be sneaky like that. Chocolate covered broccoli. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Nolan. For uh, for the group, there is. Do we still have the uh, the space uh, model behind you, or is there anything else in the in the magical no, I background? Don't, I have it on on my mantelpiece. I decided okay. to bring it out <laughs> into public view. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to point out that that is that is a real background behind you. Um, he's always tinkering and inventing. So, uh, kudos. Thank you so much for your time. It was great to chat again. Thank you, Dr. Haynes. Stephanie, thanks for putting it together. And uh, with that, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Any other yeah. closing points? Absolutely. Buy Thanks. the book. Buy several of them. They're good for <laughs> breakfast. Um, you know, and give them away. Because I really think that that, as a manifesto, can, it's our way of infecting minds in a good way. And please uh, reach out to uh, to ELB if we could help you with strategy, with ideas, if you'd like to try some of the games, if you'd like to meet with one of our consultants, this is what we do. Come cool. see us at any one of the uh, of the conferences that our team is out and about at. And Nolan, Dr. Haynes, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Have a great day, everybody. Everyone. Have a great rest of your day.